It's over 9,000! Welcome, Super Elite Warriors, to Final Forum, a podcast for the discussions of all things Dragon Ball. I am your host, Jelly, an elite recruiting member of the Frieza Force on a mission to find the best warriors from across the galaxy to join the greatest army of all time. And I am joined, as always, by my new recruit co-host. This is Bikini. Listen, this place gives me the heebie-jeebies. Can we just beat feet and out of here already? Without making a full report to Lord Frieza... Something tipped off our scouters here, and we're honor-bound to check it out. Forget honor. I want to live. Didn't you want to die like a few hours ago? That was the past. Now I'm all about life. Good, because we have yet to find any on this planet. And the scouters indicate there should be some. I meant my life. Well, if you want your life to be the one where you get paid, then you need to help me look around so we can make a full report to Frieza. And speaking of detailed reports, listeners, we're here on SETI YZ-3, a desolate, windswept planet which, near as I can tell, exists solely in a spectrum that members of my species would identify as yellow. Yellow sand, yellow rocks, yellow tinted skies, and not much else. There's occasional valleys, canyons, uh, mildly interesting rock formations... But this place looks like one where life does not flourish. Contrary to our scouter's indication that there is some, and our long-range scouter having previously picked up a large power reading. However, as we know, some fighters can suppress their power level or only unleash their true power on transformation. Uh, We have to make a complete sweep of the area near where our scouter picked up its reading, which we're doing by flying in a circular pattern... Uh, in order to cover an optimal area with limited effort. Hey, what are the odds Lord Frieza even listens to this? I mean, he's got to have more important things to do than listen to a scrounge around some dust pit looking for we don't even know what while jabbering about some show. Everyone does. It'd take a complete loser with no friends, no family, no prospects, and basically no life to listen to this drivel. Hey, that's our target audience you're talking about, Recruit. I'm just saying. Anybody that listens to this, including Lord Frieza, must be some kind of idiot. Edited by Lord Frieza for our listeners' safety. I'm getting sick of that. For your sake, I hope Lord Frieza wasn't listening to you, insinuating that he's anything less than a gift to the entire universe. You got some brown on your nose there, Chief. Yeah, this is a pretty dirty place. Not what I meant. In any event... I think I see something over there squirming around in the dirt. The scouter indicates it is, in fact, a life form of some kind. Let's go down and check it out. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept of movies, uh, specifically horror movies, but they often start this way. Listen, if it'll make you feel any better... Whatever it is, I doubt it will. Be that as it may, it's probably time to discuss our topic for the week, and this week, we'll be talking about rabbits. Rabbits? Oh, God. I want to hop away from this conversation. We're going to be talking about episodes 8, 9, and 10. Three episodes of the show. And uh, I'm going to pass it back over to you, Bikini, to recap us on those episodes. All right. So, quick recap. Buckle in, because this is going to start off pretty bumpy. Goku rushes off to Roshi's Island to try and get Roshi to help them put out the fire on Frypan Mountain. They get there. He makes a deal with Roshi to 
help put out the fire, but Roshi says as payment he wants to be able to touch Bulma's breasts. In the American cut, they kind of just like he kind of just asked for like a walk around the beach, but obviously censorship and things change. Uh, but the reality is that he he wants to be a pervert. First, he calls out to a flying turtle named Gamera to take him to Fire Mountain. Uh, once there, he makes sure Bulma agrees to said contract. Uh, then performs a Kamehameha attack, bulking up to reveal his inner power and firing a blast from his hands. This blast puts out the fire, but also destroys the mountain and the castle on top of it where they needed to go to get the Dragon Ball. He got a little carried away, but that's what happens when you perform a technique you've been perfecting for 50 years. And Goku tries one, and though it's not as powerful as Roshi's, he can do it after you know five seconds of watching Roshi do it. Our group take their Dragon Ball and leave at this point. Then we go to an episode that feels kind of like filler, but surprisingly is featured in the manga as well. Goku, Bulma, and Oolong arrive at a town where a gang of rabbit ear wearing thugs have the townspeople living in abject terror. Turns out the boss is this giant anthropomorphic rabbit who can turn people into carrots via touching them. Uh, he turns Bulma into a carrot as kind of like a demonstration of this power, but never fear. Goku ultimately saves the day with help from Yamcha and banishes Monster Carrot to er, the moon, where he and a couple of goons start to make mochi, like these little – It's. Uh, I'll let you explain later. But the, <laughs> the dub in American English says that they're making marshmallows, but it's actually mochi, which is a completely different thing. Like I said, we'll talk about that in a minute. Then there's an episode where Goku, Oolong, and Bulma close in on the final Dragon Ball with Yamcha tailing them as he has been for the past few episodes now. They wind up getting their Dragon Ball stolen by Pilaf's gang, except for the four-star ball because Goku keeps that on him as opposed to with the rest of the Dragon Balls because he thinks it's his grandfather. Yamcha and Puar at this point decide to help the heroes get the balls back. He knows the only way to get them for himself is to track down the ones that have been stolen so that he himself can steal them. <laughs> and they come to Pilaf's castle and almost immediately stumble into some traps. The episode ends with them being stuck in a trap, and the stage is set for the finale of the Pilaf arc as the characters are all starting to come together. Yep. Not a bad little batch of episodes. You know, the Kamehameha thing is, is really cool. The, the And we can, and, and someday we will talk about the Kamehameha wave itself in detail. But while that's an interesting discussion to have, the Kamehameha comes into play throughout the entirety of the franchise. So rather than get into the wave itself and its cultural influences and all that now, I think it's best if we save it for a more action-oriented portion of the show where there's maybe a little bit less substance to it. Uh, suffice to say, it's an iconic attack, and this is the first time we see it. What's really important in that episode is we learn a little bit more about Goku as a character. You know, not only is he strong, but he's able to, if not master, then be prof immediately proficient at a technique that took a master of martial arts 50 years to perfect. This is because of two things. One is something we've already talked to about, talked about, which is Goku's ability to see the truth of things pretty much immediately at their most simple, basic form, right? Because Goku's not book smart and everything. He just sees, he believes the truth already from the get-go, and he sees it simply and easily. That's, we talked about the flat character arc that he has. So when he sees Roshi perform the wave, he understands it, and its mechanics just from the jump. He knows it's about harnessing and releasing the inner energy in an external form, and he can do it because the number two thing is Goku has a complete inner awareness. Obviously, he's naive. He's not aware of the world. Uh, he still can't tell boys from girls, and he doesn't know what marriage is, but he understands himself and his power and his limits completely. Uh, he has no misgivings about who he is, what he's capable of, and so when he tries something, he tries it with his all and gives himself over to it entirely. This is why he can perform the Kamehameha immediately. But before any of that happens, remember that Roshi calls out to Gamera, and even before that, he states that he has misplaced the Bancho fan. So let's get into that a little bit. The Bancho fan is how Sun Wukong and Tang Sanzong put out the fire on the mountains in their journey to the west. They utilize their relationship with the ox demon spirit to get the fan so they can continue their quest. Toriyama kind of takes this and flips the script a little bit by having the ox king be the one to ask the heroes for help. Uh, 
It's not a major subversion, but it shows that he's willing to play with expectations, most likely to just keep it fresh for folks that might be familiar with the source material. The Bancho fan is an ancient relic of great power, and in Journey to the West, if memory serves, it's associated with with another hermit character. Uh, So it kind of makes sense that Master Roshi would have it being the turtle hermit. But unfortunately for our heroes, in yet another subversion of this literary precedent, Roshi has thrown the fan away because it got dirty when he spilled some food on it. So for those familiar with this legend, this would be a pretty big shock akin to taking the axe out of Paul Bunyan's hands. As far as Gamera goes, that's when Roshi calls out to Gamera. For American viewers, this might just seem like a goofy way of getting Roshi from A to B. Because he can't find the Nimbus anymore due to his lecherous heart. But for a Japanese viewer, it, it might feel like some kind of a clue because of what Gamera is. Gamera is a flying turtle with giant tusks that come out of the bottoms of his mouth. And he both breathes fire and or fireballs. And he eats fire. Uh, Gamera is created initially by Daiei Studios as a response to Toho's character Godzilla. I think everyone has some familiarity with Godzilla, but Gamera is basically a knockoff. Over the ensuing years after his initial movie, which is in 1965, he goes on to have seven others until 1980 when the Japanese cinema market just collapses due to a rise in popularity of television and movies. It's something that we're also going to kind of talk about that Japanese cinema market a little bit when we discuss some of these Dragon Ball movies. Uh, But this market could no longer support making new Gamera movies. The movies start as kind of serious, uh, but definitely campy, and they grow increasingly ridiculous, ultimately culminating in things like a Gamera song meant to be sung along by children whenever he shows up, prominent child actors as main characters, and more and more outlandish monsters for Gamera to fight, including like a sentient butcher knife, essentially, space bats, giant octopuses, octopi? It gets insane. Uh, The sequel market at that time, remember, in general, not just in Japan, but everywhere, is all about diminishing returns. You make the sequel for less money because you're guaranteed to make less money. That's just how sequels were up until, I don't know, 2005. So Daiei Daiei just basically just wants to bilk some kids and their parents out of some cash. I have, I have an affinity for the Gamera movies, um, and it seems like Toriyama does as well, using Gamera in his, in his show. And he used Gamera several times, apparently, in Dr. Slump as an homage, and he does it again in Dragon Ball. And that just you know reinforces how important tokusatsu, which is the Japanese special effects that are traditionally done with a man in suit, are to Toriyama. We talked a little bit about Ultraman last episode. Well, here's another instance of that appearing in Dragon Ball. Before we move on from Gamera and talk more about the significance of the Dragon Ball, I just want to note real quick, Arrow Video has released a pair of Blu-ray releases. I'm sure they're not as cheap as the Ultra Q ones we talked about last episode because they're from Arrow Video, and Arrow makes, like, top-notch sets. The Showa era, or earlier era, of Gamera movies from 65 to 80 is in one set, and there's another set for the Heisei era from 95 to 2006. I cannot strongly recommend the Heisei era Gamera trilogy enough for people who like monster movies at all. Uh, That ran from 95 to 99. They're three of the best tokusatsu movies that exist, period. They represent some of the highest peaks in the genre in terms of special effects, um, and they stand as a monument to the idea that a reboot can vastly improve upon the original. The director for them, Shizuki Kaneko, actually was a huge Godzilla fan, and when he went to meet with Daie, he pitched them... I want to do this this other character called Daimajin, which is another trilogy of movies in the 60s and 70s, I think, that is about a giant stone statue coming to life uh, and, and getting revenge for an oppressed townspeople. That's basically what all three movies are about. He pitched them that, and they were like, no, we want Gamera. And he went home. He went home to his wife. He was like, I got a, I got a gig today. <laughs> and she was like... <laughs> She was like, oh, doing what? And he's like, making a, a tokusatsu movie. And she was like, oh, Godzilla? You've wanted to make a Godzilla movie forever. And he was like, no, Gamera. And she was like, so not Godzilla? Uh, <laughs> that's like how Gamera is basically thought of in Japan. He's like a cheap knockoff if he's thought of at all. But these three movies that the director for 
uh, Shizuki Kaneko made in the 90s are spectacular. To go back to how Gamera ties into to Dragon Ball, uh, a Japanese viewer might see Gamera show up and think he's going to eat the flames on Fire Mountain because Gamera eats fire. Uh, obviously, that's not what happens, but it's another way Toriyama is keeping his uh, his audience guessing. He's giving them something familiar and subverting it at the same time. This keeps people feeling like Dragon Ball is relatable and has that comfort food kind of feel to it, but it's also new and exciting and unpredictable at the same time. But perhaps less unpredictable, and maybe for an Asian audience, is, I don't know, maybe a little less interesting, is the... The next episode, the Monster Carrot episode, uh, but for American viewers, and this would at one point include myself, who think of it as just some oddball one-off in Dragon Ball that's maybe even filler, there's actually a lot of cultural history in this coming episode. And, and this one goes way, way back. So in Indian and Buddhist culture, there's a story uh, about the various gods, uh, one of which at one point becomes a dazzling white rabbit. He and the other animal gods pledge to feed any weary travelers that come across with the rabbit, vowing that since he cannot feed humans his own food, which is grass, he would sacrifice his own body to feed them. To test him, another deity descends from the moon and pretends to be a hungry person, at which point the rabbit throws himself into a fire to feed the man. The man picks up the rabbit out of the fire, reveals himself to be this said deity, and then vows that all will know the rabbit forever by etching his face into the moon. Much like Americans see the craters on the moon and think of the man in the moon, East Asian cultures see a rabbit. And just so to story... break in real quick, we're going to post – because I – if you if you asked me to find the rabbit in the moon, I would be like, what in the name of holy hell are you talking about? But if you, if, you search, <laughs> if you search for it online, and we'll post a couple pictures to our social media too, there's places that will outline it for you and show you where this rabbit is. And once it's pointed out, you're like, okay, okay, I can see that. All right. Anyways, this story is old as time itself in, in East Asian culture, and it makes its way over to China where it's told and retold and adapted more for like Chinese Buddhism uh, and their culture until it's mixed with a story about a pair of deities who descend from the moon to earth, lose their immortality, and in a quest to regain it, one of them overdoses on medicine, causing them to hurtle back towards the moon. You know, because that's stuff that happens. Yeah. Where he sees a rabbit who has made the medicine in a mortar. Uh, there's never anything said in the Chinese legend about, like, this rabbit in particular or how it ended up on the moon. But in Chinese culture, they have festivities revolving around full moons, and they're seen as a sign of good health and good fortune. So eventually that story then in turn makes its way to Japan where it gets mixed in with their culture until basically every Japanese person who looks up at the moon from the time they're a baby thinks of the craters on the moon as a rabbit staring into a mortar. But instead of medicine and instead of it being etched in there as a sign of this rabbit's dutiful nature and sacrifice, he's just making mochi. So mochi is a sweet rice treat eaten as a dessert first full moon of every year new year in japan is called the mochi festival and it's it's ingrained in the culture kind of like christmas is for for western audiences basically like this rabbit is kind of like familiar to children in asian cultures like santa claus is familiar to kids in western cultures people are taught it from such a young age that they never really even question it and Toriyama decides that he wants to explain how the rabbit got to the moon, so he has Goku take him there. And the capper to the episode is Monster Carrot, a.k.a. Boss Rabbit, making mochi on the moon as punishment for being a bad guy. And that bad guy is part is something of an inversion of the cultural history of the legend, just another example of Toriyama flipping the mundane and well-known on its head. Yeah, it's I, I never knew any of that, right? But it is it's it's pretty interesting. And you know, to tie this back into something we've talked about in the last couple of episodes with Tokusatsu, there's there's actually a really good episode of um oh man, I want to make sure I know which which Ultraman is. I'm pretty sure it's Return of Ultraman. There's a character that descends from the moon named Mochiron, who who is just a giant mochi mortar. Um oh, <laughs> I said Return of Ultraman. He appears in Ultraman Taro, and he's just a giant mochi mortar, and he walks around the Earth like eating all mochi. 
He he's got a great design. He looks awesome, and the way that Ultraman Taro beats him is by pounding Mochi in the mortar portion of him. It's super funny. But... And for for those that aren't familiar or who have never seen it, uh, it's essentially like a three man operation with two people using like large mallets to to beat the. Uh, I, I'm assuming it's rice inside this thing, and yeah, then somebody like. A... like rice flour intermittently like jumping in there and kind of like mixing it with their hand as well it's 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 almost theatrical and like how how active its creation is yeah it's pretty cool stuff i've never had it actually um i'd like to try it just to just to try it i mean put we'll put that on the bucket list when our mission's over <laughs> but so I, th- I think something to talk about here is you know we talked about the this flipping the script right the the rabbit in east asian culture is on the moon uh almost always either just because he's there right because that's just where he's always been type of thing or as a sign of his virtue uh and then toriyama says no it's because he's a bad guy you know um (laughs) and and then he also you know says the bancho fan that's how they put out the fire no it's not you know, and uh, maybe it's Gamera. No, it's not. Or he takes these f- super familiar things and he subverts them. He, f- he flips them on their head. So we could talk a little bit about subversion in Dragon Ball as a whole, I think. It's 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 a very common thing that Toriyama does throughout. And I, I mentioned it earlier, but the thing that it really does, I, it's it's a hard feeling to describe if you've never had it yourself, but if you've ever felt like you were watching something or experiencing something that had a very almost deja vu kind of feel to it, but at the same time you had no idea where it was heading and you just felt very comforted by it, but you'd never experienced it before. That's what this action from Toriyama does He's able to make things feel familiar and feel comfortable for his art audience, but at the same time, they can't ever be able to accurately predict how it's going to end. And that's not easy to pull off. No, I, I would agree with that, definitely. We've seen how many things get taken to bat in recent movies for for just being subversive. I mean... Dare we invoke the name of Star Wars? And and I was gonna go. I was gonna go even further and say Game of Thrones. No, that's (laughs) we subverted your expectations. That's why you hate it. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 not why I hate this ending. That's a very that's a that's an even better example. I would I would argue honestly. Yeah, so. For those for those who aren't familiar with Game of Thrones, the the story about you know a, a king dying in a fictional medieval setting, and then the power vacuum left by his death, and the struggle to acquire the throne. The way the show ended was very displeasing for most fans, and when the producers and writers of the show, it's like Ben Ben Off and Weiss. Benioff and Weiss, yes. Yes, when they were asked about it, rather than admitting any culpability of their own at all, and we can have arguments all day long about whether they're to blame, whether HBO is to blame, because I think a big okay, part... You get no argument from me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I think a big part of of why it was so poorly received for sure was that they here's this show that for the first five seasons built up characters and events and arcs and everything so meticulously and then in like the sixth season you started seeing little cracks in that like journeys that would take several episodes and season one would be done you know middle of an episode in season six that kind of stuff didn't bother me um, because I was like, we're getting to the end. Like, I know that these journeys take them a long time. You established it for five seasons. I don't need to keep seeing that. But that's like kind of the first thing that started showing up. And then they started doing that with actual story elements rather than establishing something and building it up and then ultimately dropping the reveal. And you're like, oh, whoa, that was so well written and so meticulously built to. They were just like, oh, this person's a bad guy now. <laughs> and. 
they flat out said, well, the it's just because we subverted expectations. That's why people don't like it. And I think something Crazy. something like Dragon Ball can kind of show how you can you could subvert expectations and to an extent you can even do it in a very shorthand fashion. I think the Bancho fan itself, right? Him just being like, I threw it out because it got dirty. <laughs> that's a very yeah. that's a very quick kind of subversion, but there's ways to do it that are right and ways to do it that are wrong. Yeah, and I and I think there's there's a right way to play on on a an audience's expectations and a wrong way to play on those expectations. It funnily enough goes back to Game of Thrones when uh Martin, the guy who's writing the series of books, was talking when people ask him like, "Oh, you know, did did people uh when they were theorizing about the show, did they actually like figure out what your and storyline's going to be, and he's like, "Well, maybe, maybe not." And and people were like, "Well, are you going to change it because based on people's theories?" And he's like, "Well, no, because the story needs to be internally consistent, and it needs to 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 follow its logical conclusion. Just because somebody figured it out before it was revealed, doesn't mean I should change the storyline because that would just cheapen the story as a whole. And that's kind of what it felt like they did in Game of Thrones." Versus what they do here in Dragon Ball is they take a known quantity, for instance, the Bancho fan, which you're like, oh, well, that's the MacGuffin that's going to fix the problem. Oh, no, that MacGuffin's gone. No one has it. It's an, it's in a garbage dump somewhere because it begs the question, well, then how are we going to solve the problem? And then he throws you the red herring with Gamera, which again, you think, oh, we'll have Gamera eat the flames and, and it'll everything will be good. And then again, nope, Gamera was just there to get him to Fry Pan Mountain. He's just going to blow the mountain up with his own power. <laughs> yeah. I, I also think – I think good subversion of expectations plays just as well to people who don't have those expectations, right? Yes. So something something like Dragon Ball, the Bancho fan, an American viewer has no idea what it is. Like you said, doesn't know any of the literary history. Thinks it's just a a, a MacGuffin. MacGuffin, and then it's thrown away. Same thing with Gamera too. They don't think anything of it, other than it's just a joke. It's just a funny way to have Master Roshi spinning around on the back of a turtle, and then he gets off of it and pukes. Uh, just 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 a deadpan. Have more kind of humor around Master Roshi. That take on it works unto itself. You don't have yeah. to you don't have to know the background and the history to be able to appreciate the story progression the way it is. I think that's, you know, when you talk about something like Game of Thrones and they're like, well, you just don't like it because it subverted expectations. Like, no, we don't like it because it doesn't work in the story. Like, it's a complete it's it's not it's not because of my expectations of where the story we're going to go. It's because of where you led me to. And then, right. I think, I think the best way I've seen it explained is I don't necessarily have a problem with the major plot points. I just have a problem with how we got there. Yeah. It's, you, you know, you know, a pretty good example kind of, of that piece, that part is, um, I don't know. Did you ever watch how I met your mother? Uh, I've watched some of it. Yeah. Okay. Do you know how it ends? Yes, and I'm aware that there a lot of people were unsatisfied with how it ended. If you would have told me in season one that that was the ending, season two, season three, season four, even, I probably would have been like, yeah, that that makes sense. By the time you get to like the ninth season of the show, these characters have all undergone so many other journeys and changes and transformations, and then you just flip it at the end, just to flip it, just to hit your preconceived notion of what the ending was was gonna be that that you they i'm pretty sure they must have filmed that ending day one um because they have child characters in that ending who are the exact same age that they were when the show started and it oh wow was nine years long but it doesn't fit with what you've done anymore and that, I think, is a Game of Thrones thing, too. You've done all this other stuff that builds to a certain point, and then you flip it just because... And we don't know for sure that Martin's going to stick with that as the ending, but just because he told you that that's how it ends. Yeah. But everything you guys have done, you know, there's everything you've built for six, seven, eight seasons, whatever it was, has pointed 
in a certain direction and just switching it just because that's what the author tells you is hap- going to happen in his version uh, you don't have to do that uh, you look at we're we're big Stephen King fans here the two of us uh, did you ever read Dr. Sleep you know it's a little embarrassing to admit but no I have not read it yet did you see the movie I also did not see the movie oh man <laughs> um, it, that's a very I, I, I typically I like to read the books before I, I watch the movie that's that's a, that's a very good example though of like the first 66 75 percent the first two thirds to three quarters of that book and that movie are so similar it's it's like oh he combined those three characters into this one and oh he took out this little detail and that right when he when making the movie and then right. the movie due to due to the 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 book the shining versus the movie the shining mm-hmm. um and we all know i mean at this point it's not at all a spoiler to talk about that in the book the shining the overlook hotel explodes correct and in the movie it obviously does not due to that piece of it the director s- starts veering off in a different direction because the overlook hotel still exists mm-hmm. and so he starts going down a different path because it still exists in the movie world and he sticks to that path he doesn't just suddenly switch things just to get things back in line with where the book was i mean you got to give a man respect for sticking to his artistic convictions you know we we talked about star wars so i think that's been a, a somewhat recent talk about subverting and, and subversion of expectations too uh, you know with I, I I hate to even invoke the name of this movie because it's gonna like immediately make half the podcast hate us and half the podcast love us. But the Last Jedi, that was a movie yeah. that was that was very much like the the discussion around it was all about whether you liked it and whether it was good based on it subverting expectations. And I also would, would I would point to that as not a great example of how expectations are subverted. Some of them in it kind of are, but some of them are not. I remember reading a really good comparison one time of sort of subverting the way The Last Jedi subverts expectations versus, to pick another really popular movie, Avengers Endgame. Now, granted, not Endgame, Infinity War. Granted, Endgame sort of undoes a lot of the subversions of Infinity War. But I'll never forget being in that movie theater for the first time during Infinity War and being like, well, this is a superhero movie, of course. And it's it's a Marvel movie, especially. It's going to have a happy ending. They're all going to win. Everything's going to be great. And then, like, Vision gets killed. And then everyone gets killed. (laughs) And the Not and the movie just, just, just ends. Just half of everyone. Just and the movie just everyone. ends with with Captain America being like, "Oh my god," and that's like the end of the movie. That's a great example of this. This probably this probably gives a little bit too much of a view into to me personally, but I like to watch uh, YouTube videos of kids reacting to the end of that movie because like ninety percent of the time they start crying and it makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was like. I remember being in that movie theater with with little kids, like asking their parents questions afterwards, being like, "Wait a minute, they're all dead!" And it's like, "Is yeah. Spider Man gonna be okay?" And the parents being like, "Especially because you know, it was a lot of these parents were parents that definitely take their kids to these movies, but don't necessarily pay attention to these movies, and they were just like, <laughs> I don't know, they they just lost, <laughs> like." <laughs> I think I think that's a really good example though of some, because I think the way it's all played in Infinity War it all still works like even today even knowing that Endgame is around if you go back and watch Infinity War those it's still a, yeah it's still a solid solid movie those deaths and that downer ending still hit yeah because in absolutely. that in that movie and in that moment they still matter Game of Thrones those subversions in that moment they don't feel like they matter anymore and they don't hit and and it's funny I, I think dragon ball like learning about some of these these cultural things and the and those those things hit you know especially the the, the punchline at the end of this rabbit episode of he's up there making mochi with with two goons you know and they're they're rabbit shaped mochis or whatever but like you, you know knowing 
knowing what I learned off of a few minutes of research into Japanese folklore, that works. That's a funny, especially because, I mean, you know, yes, Game of Thrones and Star Wars and Infinity War are meant to be more serious than Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball is definitely meant as more of a comedy, but, I mean, the well, it's at still the same hits. time, it's meant as a comedy, but like as we've been showing, especially these past couple episodes here, there's a surprising amount of depth to the writing as far as, as cultural references and things go. I think it shows the strength of the show itself that like, you know, two guys like us can just do like some digging on our own and find all this stuff and it adds so many more layers to what Initially, I'm sure when we first watched the show, felt like, oh, this is just a, a silly Japanese anime about some goofy kid, you know? Yeah. Especially that the the boss boss rabbit episode. I mean, I always I assumed that was filler. I mean, yeah, same here. <laughs> I, I was I was pretty surprised when I first learned that that was not filler. I just I've it. it really doesn't progress the actual you know that is that if if you're talking about a complaint of it it doesn't really progress the actual plot of the manga the the story whatever at all it doesn't it doesn't tell us a whole lot about any of the characters except uh, you know maybe Yamcha a little bit cuz he does I was going to say there's probably a little bit of growth for Yamcha in that episode he does uh he does help out Goku when as as Goku is trying to save Bulma, Ma- Ma- Monster Carrot or Master Carrot or Boss Rabbit says, like, if you fight me and you fight my guys, I'm going to eat this carrot. I'm going to eat the carrot of Bulma. So Goku just stands down and starts getting just the crap kicked out of him. <laughs> yeah. And Yamcha comes in and makes the save. So, I mean, that, that definitely shows you a little bit of Yamcha's true heart as much as he talks about wanting to steal the dragon balls and 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 be a bandit and whatnot you definitely get a glimpse into he's got more depth to him than that so yeah i would say it's it's pro that it's that point where it's it's less he's a third party that's following them and more or less becomes part of the group right even though he doesn't even though he still falls into the background again in in a bit until they they get the dragon ball stolen yeah he he feels like he's part of the team once he joins them with beating up the rabbit bosses. Also a, a good part of this batch of episodes is it gets Bulma out of the Playboy Bunny costume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, and, you know, fun stuff. <laughs> it's almost like, you know, there could be a whole episode about sexuality in Dragon Ball. Uh, yeah, I don't know when we would have the time for that, though. <laughs> but another another kind of just interesting thing to note with this batch of episodes, and, and all the episodes, really, is it this should this should be the point for people where if you've been listening to us talk about this being journey to the west and a journey for a chinese monk heading to india you start seeing that indian appearance of things start to creep into the design sure yeah i mean even the even the the not just her clothes but the town that they're in how the people in that town are dressed the apparent climate of the area all of that changes uh, as soon as they get to this town, kind of, I guess, indicating that they're they're reaching the end of their journey. But I I really appreciate that like he took the time to think about that and go, oh well, if they're getting towards the end of Journey of the West, we need to change up the the you know the the places that they're going to be in. Right, right. So yeah, that's that's subversion in Dragon Ball. You know, one thing. Um, you mentioned to me offline when we were talking about subversion, just to bring it up here again uh, for our listeners, is this is this is not just something in these episodes. You had mentioned like with Oolong. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got this this other character that in the Journey of the West was like this big, formidable ally. And you would think if you're familiar with the source material and you're watching this show, you think, oh, this is where they pick up a strong guy. And now they pick up a weakling, good for nothing coward. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in in Journey to the West, that that character whose name I no longer remember, uh, but he's called like the Master of Transformations, and yeah. Oolong, Oolong is uh, what he can hold of. Oolong for five calls minutes. himself the Master of Transformation. <laughs> but... 
Um, Nobody believes it. So yeah, so that that kind of stuff is it's sprinkled all throughout, and you know once you once you you're tuned into it a little bit more, it just kind of adds like we said a depth and a layer to it. And as we keep going, and you know there's. 300 more episodes of anime and however many manga chapters to review we'll we'll keep pointing those out along the way but it's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind too is is this subversion working is this done well is this smart is this maybe a bad one it's just a it's just a piece to this uh wide franchise so and i'm i'm definitely going to uh Definitely going to be keeping my eyes on it going forward. That's for sure. Yeah. So, are you still wishing you could hop away now that we're seeing what SETI YZ3 has in store for us? I mean, I guess this armored slug worm is a mild curiosity. Though I don't know that it requires much study, and it's certainly of no interest to our mission. There's no way this thing could possibly have tipped our long-range scouter, nor any chance that it can transform into a decent fighter. You say that now. But you know, this means we can log it and get out of here, right? Seriously? We're leaving? Of course. You can't communicate with this thing. It has no battle power, and this planet seems deserted. If anyone was here who was a worthy warrior, they probably either died or left already. Sure, some fighters can mask their power, but in a desolate wasteland like this, where only sandworms lid, live, would anyone want to hide from two elite members of the Frieza Force? You really think I'm an elite warrior? Does that mean you're not going to be calling me recruit anymore? Of course not. I'll still be calling you that. But a casual outside observer wouldn't know any better. Hey, look, this worm's crawling up my arm. <laughs> it's kind of tickling my ear. Well, on that note, we'll take our leave, listeners. Hey, it's starting to not tickle? Is it? Ah! Is it going into my ear? Will this carnivorous ear slug slurp up all of Bikini's brains? What? Will we escape the clutches of certain doom we found on SETI YZ3? Seriously, what? I, I, can't, I can't hear you. Will Bikini's minor hearing loss be repaired before this little guy eats his gray matter? Find out next time and help us achieve our final forum. is written and produced by Tom Gwelly. It is performed by Dan Kinney and Tom Gwelly. Our webmaster is Dan Kinney. Our theme music is provided by YouTube content creator GVG Kit. Want to learn more about the Dragon Ball universe, including concept art, behind-the-scenes interviews, and recommendations from Jelly and Bikini? Connect with us on social media. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at Final Forum Pod. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you receive your podcasts. And of course, make sure to share with your friends and family and help us spread the word of the glory of Lord Frieza. The Frieza Force thanks you for your listenership. 